Good morning, everybody. And it is a good morning. It is November 15th, 2017. And we are going to be looking at the time right around the year 1000. So you think about millennia, and I don't know whether any of you were around for the millennium between 1999 and 2000 when everyone thought the world was going to end, but in the year 1000, it was the same consciousness only in spades. And everyone was certain that the world was going to end, of course. In every millennium, this happens. But of course, at this time, we have such unrest and we have this Christianization of Europe that's happening. So when the world didn't end, they began to build churches and make artwork. It was actually the, um, the Christian faith burgeoned after that, if you will. So in the 10th century, which is the 900s, and so after Charlemagne, so this is, we're leaving Charlemagne and moving to the next dynasty, if you will, which does eventually turn into the Holy Roman Empire, which is around until 1913 or something with the Habsburgs. But anyway, in late 1900s, we have Saxon rulers. They're rising up in the eastern part of the Carolingian Empire, which, of course, is modern Germany and Austria. So that is the area of the world that we're in for this lecture. They had a series of victories over Vikings, very shrewd political moves. They gained control of Italy in 951. And you can remember Charlemagne did the same thing. He wanted to Italy, but they became an empire with the sanction of the Pope in 962. So this became a union of Germany and Italy under German rule. And this is the beginning, the inception of the Holy Roman Empire. So here's a map because we love maps. You can see Germany and Austria. So the center part of, of Europe, so we're slightly west of Charlemagne. After Charlemagne died, the Carolingian Empire was divided up between his heirs. Same old story. We'll have a very strong emperor, but when he's gone, there's somehow that unifying force often will die with him. And so these are little principalities with very little central authority. And his son Conrad, of course, dies in 1024. So again, right around this 1000 magic year. We have another wave of migrations that happens during this time. It was called the Great Army. And the Vikings, they made their way all the way into Italy. They ended up sacking Rome. They, they were extremely strong. And so pretty much the Slavs from the east, from what's now Russia, and the Vikings from the north kind of sent Western Europe into a freeze for about a century. And monasteries, of course, start building defensive walls. So Charlemagne's educational program came to a halt. So the time period we're studying now is actually in tandem with the Ottoman Emperor, Ottoman Empire, Emperor, there was an Ottoman Emperor and the Ottoman Empire. So they're a new family of rulers that are gaining power. And they're based again, east of the Rhine River. So here's sort of their trajectory. First, we have Otto I, who married a Lombard queen in 1951, universe unifying Western Europe. And he was crowned the emperor of the West in 962, which began the Holy Roman Empire. And he arranged a marriage between his son, Otto II, and a Byzantine princess, Theophano. And of course, nobody but a Byzantine princess would do because he was bent on creating a Holy Roman Empire. So he needed both sides of the Holy Empire. She came to the Etonian court with her own artists, Byzantine artists, works of art in Byzantine style. So. Otto II died in 983, and he left a three-year-old son, Otto III. So his mother and his grandmother ruled. They, they, she, um, Theophano was a regent until Otto III was 16 years old. Now, I do want to say 
One other thing about the Vikings at this time, um, here's a here's a ivory of Christ crowning Otto II and Theophano in their marriage. This panel was probably intended as a book cover, and of course their marriage took place in Rome. So the Vikings are a threat throughout this entire time period and from the Carolingian period as well. But it's important to note that new evidence has come to light that there were some burnings of monasteries and other events that were blamed on the Vikings but weren't necessarily the Vikings. And sometimes the Vikings worked in tandem with other kings or other people that were jostling and fighting for power. So this deep freeze that's happening is much more complicated than scholars had assumed, say, even 20 years ago. There's always new evidence coming to light and new scholarship coming out. So it's history, and in particular art history, is a living, breathing entity. And it's very easy to give an entire culture of people a bad rap, which there's no doubt that the Vikings were vicious, they were warriors, but they also, they didn't destroy everything in their path. And they also recognized the value of things. For example, they stole a very valuable Bible, but then they ransomed it to get it back. They just didn't burn everything blanketly. They were after plunder and they got it. But at any rate, an event like this, with, with creating this marriage between East and West and legitimizing it with this type of image was very important for centralizing this empire of Otto III. And it give, helps create it, if you will, as a spiritual bastion against the outside forces. Because external forces, we have the Vikings, we have the Slavs, we have the Islamic horde. So there's inscriptions on this, and I've just give them, given them to you here in Greek, in case you're a Greek scholar. And it says, Lord, come to the aid of your servant, John. So, But look how beautiful this carving is. And this is quintessentially Etonian style, is this very expressive, but yet very contemplative. And we have very detailed carving in the robes. Um, Ornamentation sort of harkens back to this Byzantine love of ornamentation. And we have the same type of detailing on the draperies and around the outside as well. This is another example of an Etonian sculpture it's, um, and book covers. And there was many scriptorium, again, as Charlemagne did, Otto also did, was he funded scriptoria and they made quite a bit of manuscript illumination and these kinds of book covers. And in this one, Otto I is presenting the Magdeburg Cathedral to Christ. So again, with the millennium and the fact that the world did not end, there was this advent of building, building these beautiful cathedrals and they often would whitewash them because they felt that the world had escaped the apocalypse, if you will. So the world, they saw it as washed clean. So many of the churches would be whitewashed on the outsides. Now, these figures, if you think back to Charlemagne's classical revival, in particular, the Palace School of Manuscript Illustration, we don't have any of the classical influence on a book cover like this. They're very stubby, they're very block-like. So it's sort of this waning of naturalism that's going to happen. And you're gonna see this more and more as we move toward the Romanesque style and the Gothic style. This naturalism does not reappear until, if you take it, Survey 2 or the Italian Renaissance is when you start seeing it again and the Northern Renaissance. This particular plaque is one of a series of 19. And originally they were architectural sculpture. It might've been on the pulpit of the cathedral of the choir, but the cathedral burnt after 1000 CE and they rescued these panels and they turned them into other things like book covers. So Otto is smaller here than the patron saints and St. Mauritius is shown behind Otto. So here's Otto down here. Now, the central figure that we're going to discuss with one or two satellite images is this man, Bishop Bernvard of Hildesheim. And Bishop Bernvard was quite the colorful character. 
He was the tutor to Otto III. He was a true Renaissance man. He was extremely learned. He did everything. He was a goldsmith. He wrote books. He illuminated manuscript. He was an architect. He was an accomplished sculptor. And he dedicated the Cathedral of St. Michael's, which we'll see at the end of this lecture. So Atonian sculpture in general, and you've seen a couple of examples, was inspired by Roman influences, Byzantine influences, and Carolingian influences in later or greater amounts. So Bishop Berenvard was um, a traveler as well as all of these other things, and he went on a pilgrimage to Rome, and he saw a lot of artwork there, and he saw um, Roman church, which we'll look at a picture of a little later. And so he, when he came back, he wanted to recreate the glories that he saw there. And so he saw the wooden doors of this church, Santa Sabina, and he wanted to create his own doors, so he created them out of bronze. So these are the bronze doors of Bishop Bernvard, and this is from the Abbey Church of Hildesheim in Germany. And so up to this point, Bronze doors are usually made out of plain sheets of bronze. Now, think about this for a minute. Now, why would we want a bronze door on a church? Well, it's a lot harder to put a battering ram through a bronze door. So they would be armored. As we've seen, we have this onslaught where the monasteries have to be fortified. They have to defend themselves. There's very, very valuable objects inside. Think about those solid gold book covers that we've seen. So they armor their doors. So Berenvard decided that instead of a plain bronze door, he'd take his chances on God protecting his sculpture and a battering ram bashing it. And he decided to make these doors sculptural. And so all of the rectangle pa panels, if you think about the Carolingian gospel books, like think about the Utrecht gospel, for example, these little panels are sort of recalling these framed figures. So we're going to look at a couple of these panels. because You can kind of see them. They almost look like little stick figures on this slide, but they're really delightful. They're truly some of my favorite historical sculpture for whatever reason. So here are the doors, this is sort of an overall view, and you can see the lion mouthed, the lion handles with the rings in their mouths to open the doors. And each one is divided into eight registers, as you can see, these, these little separate panels, each with their own piece of the story. So on the top, we begin with the shaping of Adam and Eve, and then it, it goes through Genesis down at the bottom. We have the murder of Abel by Cain, and the fact that God liked Abel's sacrifice better, and Cain didn't like that, so he murdered his brother. First historical depiction of fratricide, if you will. And then on the right, we start at the bottom, with the Annunciation, and then the, the one on the very top ends with the resurrection of Christ. So the overall theme, of course, is sin comes into the world, and then the means through which one can attain salvation. So you have the beginning of, you have the beginning of creation, and then, of course, creation into the spiritual world as the correspondence on the right. And this slide gives you these correspondences, so I don't need to read them all, but we're we're going to look at the creation of Adam, we're going to look at the temptation and the fall, and we're going to look at the crucifixion. So these two, the temptation and fall, we have the tree of knowledge, if you will, versus the tree of life in the form of the cross. So they're very graphic, visual imagery symbols of Christian doctrine at the time, at the year 1000. So at the bottom, of course, Abel murdered by Cain, despair and sin with the Annunciation versus hope and everlasting life. I don't have images of those, but you can find them online. So here's the creation of Adam and Eve. And so you see upper in the left, there's an angel. She's hovering over two little plants. And then in the middle, we have God bending over and he's holding this nude figure, this little tubular looking figure. I mean, it's, it's such a warm, it, God is so humanized here. He's a sculptor. He's creating the human figure. And then on the right, we have this interesting plant with intertwining branches. And then this nude figure on the right standing with hands raised. 
So there's different interpretations of these. And often, as you'll see in Christian art, there'll be continuous narrative scenes where different parts of a scene are all happening at the same time. So some people say that both figures are Adam. Adam's being created in, by God in the middle and he's standing over on the right. Others say, no, um, it's Eve over on the right, but then there's a question on whether there are breasts or not. So it, there's a lot of writing been done about it, and you can make your own interpretation. But God is fashioning Adam in this image. This image is the crucifixion of Christ, and Christ here, he's bearded, and he's wearing a loincloth. He's crucified on a cross outlined with shoots. So the shoots represent living wood in this particular image, and his two feet are resting on a footrest. So we have on the left, we have Longinus pointing a spear at Christ's side. The Virgin Mary is over at the far left, and you can see she's covering up her face with her hand, and she's rightly so, horrified at what's going on. And then on the right, we have Stephaton, and he's holding this handled vessel in his left hand, and he's raising a chalice toward Christ. It has vinegar wine in it, and you know, t historically, Christ, of course, refused this vinegar wine, but this vinegar wine was something that they gave to everybody that was crucified. It had opiates in it. Um, so Christ refused these opiates. And then John the Evangelist is holding a book uh, in his left hand, and he's stretching his right hand out toward Christ. So it's a very clear image full of symbolism. And the figures, they're very sort of sketchy-like, they're tubular. Again, if you think back to the Rem school in the Ebo Gospels or the Utrecht Gospels, you get sort of the same flavor. Very expressive figures in all of these. So here is the fall of man. And the figures, again, they're standing out in relief. So if you're standing next to the door, under the door, the heads actually stick right out from the bronze. And on the right, we have the serpent. He's twirled all around the trunk of the apple tree. He's got an apple in his mouth. And in the middle, here's Eve. She's facing the serpent, and she's got an apple in her, in her left hand. And then she's also extending an apple out toward Adam and the tree of life, which again, that the tree of life corresponds to the tree that Christ is crucified on. He's holding the apple in his right hand. And then behind Adam is the triple branch tree. And we have a serpent tailed bird with a human head in the tree looking toward Adam. So then what happens? God condemns them. So these very, this is so, just look at this slide. Here is God on the left, and he's pointing at Adam like, you have eaten this apple. And Adam's pointing at Eve. No, I was, she's her fault. She did it. And Eve, she's bending over. She's pointing down at the servant, serpent. Um, it's, it's his fault. So it's, it's totally a plassing of blame. And how many people listening to me can identify with this? They're covering their nudity, of course, now, where, as in the previous slide, they had no shame. Here they do, because they have eaten of this apple now, and they are ashamed of their nudity. And so here's a detail of the expulsion of Adam and Eve, and God is sending them away. And again, just so reminiscent of the earlier Rem school, so each figure so carefully crafted. Now, this is another piece of sculpture that Bishop Bernvard did for the Hildesheim Cathedral. This is called, it's called a Paschal candlestick, and it's a column, and it was inside the cathedral. It's got an interesting history to it, and this is a detail of the sculpture on it. If you remember from ancient Rome, we looked at the column of Trajan. This is another thing that... Bernward would have seen when he went to Rome were these memorial columns or this kind of architectural sculpture with marching figures and telling stories, sort of like a barbershop pole wrapping up the pole. So here we have the Dance of Salome. And here's an overall view of these columns. So this is this is all the same thing. This is this is what the whole thing looks like now. There's parts missing, which I'm going to tell you about. And here's the spiral relief. So the whole thing's just wrapped up with these scenes.
So originally it was built around 1000 CE and on the very top was what's called a oud or a crucifix which got melted down in the 16th century to make cannons. In the 16th century a lot of bronze got melted down to make cannons. That's why we don't have that much bronze sculpture. And then a hundred years later they tore the capital off it and melted it to make a bell. And the only reason we have it is from donations. In 1730, there was an evangelical church that wanted to melt the whole column for cash for the church, but they took up donations to stop that. And I encourage you to go online. There's some wonderful stories about this church and it's, it's actually a world protected site now that you can go to. Um, a world heritage site, I think is what they call it. So there's a lot of information about all of these objects in this cathedral on the internet. So just to, to finish with sculpture before we look at the cathedral itself, there's um, one item that was popular at this time were these large crucifixes and they began making reliquaries as well. They had a lot of relics of saints. They had things like a shoe that is the St. Paul might have worn or a staff or bones or clothes, all different kinds of things that they would keep and put into churches. And this continues into the Romanesque period. So this is an early example. It's a wooden reliquary and it's an image of the suffering Christ. And it's a really good example of the expressive nature of Etonian art. It's very, so heavy. The weight of this dead body is just dragged down. His skin is sagging and the stomach swollen, it's bulging. So if you think of that triumphant Christ that we saw in the Lindisfarne's gospels, it's a very, very different image of Christ. And interestingly, this expressive theme is something that becomes a hallmark of German art all the way through the 20th century. So the idea is to inspire pity and awe in the viewer. The idea that Christ's sacrifice was a sorrowful time, as well as a gift that he gave of his own free will. Here's another image of it. So it's actually over six feet tall, but the focus is on suffering rather than triumphant. And this is just another example. It's just a polychromed Lindenwood Christ from the same time period, just because I think it's nice to see too. You really get a sense of that what this sculpture from this time would have looked like. I'm going to look at two churches for Etonian architecture, the Church of St. Syriacus in Gerode, Germany. It was built just before the year 1000 in 961. And then we'll look at St. Michael's of Hildesheim last. So the Etonian style is a reinterpretation of Roman buildings with local materials and techniques. There is some influence as well for, from Carolingian architecture and Byzantine architecture. And in this particular church, the choir and the apse rise at the east end over the vaulted crypt. Here's the inside of it. So this does have a three-part elevation. So the elevation is the, um, the nave arcade on the bottom and then a gallery and then a clear story to let in light. When we move to the Romanesque top churches, they lose this clear story for the most part. But in the Etonian churches, we often have this. And so we have this basic basilica plan with then the two west, the west work on one end of these two bell towers. These two, the bell towers are a strictly northern addition. And here's the interior of St. Syriaca. So very simple vertical shifts in visual rhythm. The rhythm is, is, is just a row of arcade and then a row, another arcaded row in the gallery. It's almost like a one-two time, just each arcade column, arcade column, one, two. There's no syncopation to it. And so what they do is they alternate in the, in the gallery these heavy and light supports. So it's a balance of rectangle, round, vertical movement, which when we move to the Romanesque period, we lose a lot of these um, plain ceilings and they, the churches begin to go up, culminating, of course, in the Gothic period. The galleries over the aisles are a form taken from Byzantine architecture, if you recall. 
So the last church we're going to look at is this one. This is the Abbey Church of St. Michael's in Hildesheim. So this is the church that has those bronze doors on it, design, designed by Bishop Bernvard and that column in it, and along with many other things. So this church really bridges the gap between Carolingian architecture and the simplicity that we will see in the next lecture on the Romanesque style. And the plan itself, it's partly derived from St. Gall. We've already looked at St. Gall. So you can, when we look, get into this, you'll see. So remember, Carolingian churches were often formed on a model of early Christian churches. We saw this with Charlemagne's church at Aachen. But Octonian churches are much more massive. The parts are more articulated, and this articulated articulation of parts comes to its culmination in the Romanesque style, but it's a really, a very solid beginning of this here. But that's why we call this a precursor to the Romanesque form. And so you can see this church has two transepts. So we really, we understand the separation of parts in the inside from the outside. And, and that's kind of the point is it's completely functional. That is to say that the interior is built with a specific purpose and manner in which to conduct the liturgy and the Christian sacraments and ceremonies. And then that manner of design takes form on the outside of the church. So I've given you a view here of our plan and then what the church looks like on the outside. You, so you can see these two transepts here and you actually go the entrance on this. Interestingly, it's not through a West work door as you'll see in later churches, but the, through the sides, the main entrance is on the South, but you could also go in on the other side. And so then you can look either way. And so this is just the very beginning of the separation of the nave into bays that we see later. So remember, Bernvard and like, wait a minute, Italy? No, this is in Rome. This is what Bernvard would have looked at. So I wanted you to see his influence. And so he went to Rome. He saw this church of Santa Sabina. This is where he saw those wooden doors. So he looked at this, this elevation. He looked at the light coming in. He looked at this beauty. And this is what he wanted to bring to his empire, to the Atonian empire. And so he took this, but then he made his own plan on top of it. So this is just a simple basilica style church. And you can see that the nave and then the side aisles with the, with the um, nave arcade, and then just a clear story at the top. There's not a gallery here. So in the interior of St. Michael's, we have very much the same thing, but it's just raised up much, much higher. This is another reason we call this transition. So we're, but the rhythm changes. So instead of, if you remember back to St. Syriacus, yes, we had that tripartite elevation, but here we've lost the gallery. We just have the nave arcade, and then we have the clear story at the top. And then we have this rhythm, this column, column, pier, column, column, pier, column, column, pier. So it's more syncopated. Now the ceiling was actually a little later and St. Michael's was destroyed after World War II, which a lot of our beautiful architecture was destroyed in World War II. It was a terrible time for architecture. And these big cathedrals, of course, were wonderful targets for the bombers. But um, the ceiling itself was saved because before the war, they had a pretty good idea the church would be bombed. And so they took the ceiling down and kept it for safekeeping, and then they put it back. But it was created around 1230, so it's a couple hundred years later than the church itself. And so if you click on this link, you see this wonderful image. It gives you a little bit better picture of this ceiling. And again, I encourage you to go online because this photograph does not do justice to the ceiling one bit. It's brightly colored and just beautiful. And that concludes our discussion of Atonian art and architecture and early medieval art. In the next lecture, we will begin with Romanesque art. Thank you.